From Wondery, I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. And this is British Scandal. Well, we've survived the story of Diana Mosley. This was a passionate few episodes. Very passionate. We had the three things that you need in life. Politics, treachery and love. And some other terrible stuff too. Uh, And I'm going to put it out there. Some of the best names, I think, we've ever had in a British Scandal series. This actually sounds like a new Pixar film. Bar Bar Bobo, Decker and Honks. (laughs) What do you think of Diana Mosley now? Obviously not a fan of her politics or her failure to renounce it. But you can't help but be fascinated by people who are totally seduced by stuff like that, see the horrors of it, and don't reach the rational conclusion that the rest of us would. Absolutely, and we're not the only ones to be fascinated by that. We have a guest today to help us get our heads around the enigma that is Diana Mosley. Our guest is a historian specialising in aristocratic women. She's an expert on the Mitford sisters and author of Mrs Guinness, The Rise and Fall of Diana Mitford. Lindsay Spence joins us next. Lindsay, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. When did you first become interested in the Mitfords? How would you describe your level of interest? I guess when I was in my early teens, I became very interested in aristocracy, which I know is quite weird. Everybody loved like J-Lo and 50 Cent. (laughs) And I was like, oh my gosh, I love Devil (laughs) Mitford. I think it was just watching Channel 4 documentaries and reading everything that I could. And I had some bonkers relatives. I lived beside the ruins of Antrim Castle and Shane's Castle, where Ian Fleming's stepson lives. So I was completely immersed in that old eccentric world of the aristocrats but I'm not an aristocrat obviously I was just sort of <laughs> an admirer and that's that's really the way I got got interested in them and then when social media evolved I realized there wasn't an online presence for people like the Mitfords even though they had quite a large fan base and I set the Mitford society up as a bit of a laugh because everybody had fan pages for popular celebrities And so many people joined it and I got so many opportunities. I mean, I published my first book because of the Mitford Society, which was the Mitford Girl's Guide to Life. And it really just evolved from there. Do you feel a little bit guilty for being interested in them? Do you worry about what it might say about yourself? I do. Um, When I went off and wrote other books, like on Maria Callas, Vivian Lee and other people, I started to really reassess, is this a good thing? Because... Although they're funny and they're they're absolutely daft, there is that sense that, yeah, two of them were Nazi sympathizers, and I don't condone that at all. I, I don't think that's a good thing. But obviously, when you are researching these women and making a living from them, you have to take the bad with the good, but I don't I don't think that's a, a fun part of the story at all. I think it's quite a, a serious part. And, and you know, it's good that we do address that and sort of mention that because a lot of people just say, oh, the Mitfords, aren't they wonderful? And completely gloss over that period of the 1930s. And I guess that's true of anybody who's interested in complicated, difficult, troubling yeah. moments in history. If that's something that fascinates you, that's obviously not always going to be a positive experience as you dive into it. It's not. And when I say I try to understand what motivated Diana, sometimes I feel like, well, maybe I shouldn't say that because when you want to understand somebody, it seems like a positive thing. And I don't want to seem like I'm excusing what she did or trying to empathize with it. It's very complicated. But of course, history, real history is complicated. So it is very uncomfortable, whatever subject you delve into or time period, because you're going to find things that don't resonate with your values or today's values. So let's let's go back and understand their childhood. Can you describe the Mitford household as the girls were growing up? Yeah, in my opinion, I think the girls were completely feral. They lived in the rural countryside. They didn't go to school. They were left to their own devices. Decca and Nancy would accuse their mother of total neglect. I think their genetics plays a part in their eccentricity. So they had a, a step great grandmother who raised their maternal grandfather. And she was absolutely nuts. 
she was a spiritualist and during the unification of Italy, she went to the opera wearing the Italian tricolor and she claimed that the prime minister levitated in her presence. And then their maternal grandfather was mad as well. He used to go off in these long voyages at sea and he absolutely took no provisions, no precautions. And on one occasion, he had to slaughter a dolphin to feed his children, one being the Mitford's mother. And he would talk in like a pirate dialect and just absolutely nuts. And when you look at the girls and their single-mindedness and the way they felt so confident to freely express themselves and express all of their her opinions on things, I think it really came from the gene pool, but also, I guess, just having having no guidance growing up and being allowed to do whatever you want. And that upper class thing as well, that you're not going to get in trouble and you're not going to be reprimanded because everybody in your presence is doing whatever they want as well without consequences. Were the Mitfords very affluent? They were and they weren't. Of course, being part of the aristocracy, they were quite minor aristocrats. And just to pick up on that idea that mm-hmm. when you come from an unconventional family, yes. shall we say, um, and there are a lot of siblings, um, that you're kind of pushed together by being from this very unusual situation. Did it mean they were very close when they were growing up? They were extremely, extremely close growing up. And of course, there's quite a large gap between Nancy and Debo. I think it's like 17 years. So you had the, the first group and then you had the second group. And of course, the younger ones wanted to be like the older ones. And the older ones were wanting to leave home and run away. And Diana Mitford growing up, her absolute fantasy when she was a teenager was to be kidnapped. She used to say, well, if I walk along a country road, somebody in a fast car will pull me in and kidnap me and ship me to Argentina. Aren't kids cute? Very cute. And Nancy wished that her parents were on the Titanic. They were supposed to go on the Titanic and they had a change of plan at the last moment. And Nancy used to say, gosh, I wish mom and dad, mom and Favre, as she called them, were on the Titanic because then they would be dead and I would be in charge. So nice kids. Can you give us a one line description for each of the sisters? Yes. So you have Nancy. She was an author and she was a very, very bitter individual, but she turned that bitterness into wit and became really famous and rich for it because she turned that into her novels. You have Pamela, who was essentially a farmer and uncomplicated, but she became a later in life lesbian, which the sisters thought was absolutely bonkers. But of course, today that's quite accepted. You have Diana, who when she was born, she was so beautiful. Her nurse said, well, she can't live too long. And she went off with Oswald Mosley and became a Nazi Nazi sympathizer. You have Unity Mitford, who again was nuts. And she ran away to Germany and stalked Hitler and became a Nazi. And then you have Jessica, a.k.a. Decca. She was very, very left wing and she ran off with her cousin and became a communist. And then you have Debo, who, again, like Pamela, is quite uncomplicated, but she became the Duchess of Devonshire. Wow. I mean, Christmases would have been a lot. Well, there's something for everybody, I think, in the sisters. You know, people tend to focus either on Nancy or the appalling behavior of Diana and Unity. But within the six of them, I think there's something that you can find that you you like or admire. Who's your flavor, Lindsay? Um... I quite like Nancy. I think she would be a good laugh if she liked you, I guess. And your least favourite? I would have to say probably Unity. Why? Well, when I read their letters, Unity is just so appalling. She says, well, we sat with Hitler and we discussed what was going to happen to the Jews. And she knows exactly what's going on and what's going to happen and what the intentions are. And she doesn't have any empathy. She doesn't question it. And she thinks it's all a joke, so that doesn't really sit well with me. When you say she thought it was all a joke, does that mean she didn't think it was really happening? I think she she thought it was going to happen or it was happening, but she thought it was all sort of just fun. It was fun to torture people and fun to make people suffer. And where do you think that instinct comes from? I think she was born with it. When the sisters reflect it in their later life, they said, you know, she was completely lawless. There was no working with Unity. Unity was always doing stupid things. I think it came, it was in her, but I think going to Germany and went in her letters when she describes the pageantry of the rallies and Hitler's manners, if you could imagine that, 
feeling important and at the center of things. When she was a child, people just thought she was stupid and she used to hide under the dining room table. And then getting over to Germany and being at the center of things, I think that's what really triggered her to go for it completely. As you said, there is a spectrum of views there. In your mind, what is it that attracted these girls to extreme politics? Growing up, Unity and Decca would draw a line in their nursery and hurl objects at each other and scream, you filthy communist, you filthy fascist, because at the time Unity was a fascist because of Oswald Mosley. And I think the shock value, they love to shock people and misbehave. And I think politics was just another extension of, well, we can fight over it and we can shock people and nobody can stop us. How different were they then to other posh or upper class or aristocratic families at the time. We know from previous series that Mm -hmm. um, there was some sympathy to the Nazis, even within the royal family and and upper class people. But are the Mitfords different even to the norms of upper class people at the time? I think they were very similar in their views. And of course, you've mentioned Nazi Germany, loads of aristocrats and also rich people were going to meet Hitler and they were hosting Nazis at their homes in London. And even Lord and Lady Londonry in Belfast were hosting, you know, the top brass of the Nazi party. I think it's when World War II happened and people were being arrested for their views. I think there was a real shift that people were perhaps not ashamed of their association, but it didn't look good for the family and they started to change their views. I know the Mitford's dad, he stood up in Parliament and completely tore into Hitler once war was declared. So he did change his views after thinking, you know, oh, he's a he's a wonderful chap. But they weren't very different in in that they thought they could do what they wanted and see who they wanted. And, you know, you have to realize at the time as well, um, people were very anti-Semitic, not just the aristocrats, but working class people too. There was a, just this common attitude against foreign people and different people. Of course, the Mitfords took it to a different level. And I, I hope I can mention, I forgot to say that when Diana was a teenager, she used to go to Winston Churchill's country home. Um, Clementine Churchill was her cousin. And she met Professor Lindemann, who was saying all of these pro-Nazi things before Hitler adopted those views. You know, the Aryan race is superior and just had these really abhorrent opinions on disabled people and Jews. And Diana was a teenager and very, very impressionable. She thought, oh my gosh, here's somebody with all the answers. So I think she was influenced from about the age of 15 before she really went with it. At 18, she meets Brian Guinness and they become secretly engaged. How did that come about? How did that sit with the Mitford family? She met him at a debutante dance and she thought he was really clingy and sentimental. But I think she was intrigued because finally somebody was interested in her. And of course, he was he was so rich. It didn't sit well with her family. Her mother didn't really like rich people. And I guess we could say she didn't like new money. She says, well, of course, some people can't help being rich, but really Diana, the Guinnesses. And that, I think, made Diana want to go for it even more because her parents disapproved. And of course, she saw Diana, she saw Brian Guinness as a way of leaving home and being independent and living this really elaborate lifestyle that she longed for in her youth. So what was it about the millionaire Brian Guinness that she fell for? I guess freedom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that he worshipped her. He wasn't going to be too complicated. And then she found that quite suffocating in the end because he didn't want to go to work. He wanted to write poetry and admire her and worship her. And she was like, oh, my gosh, just go away. Do you think she was in love with him? I think she loved what he could um, give her at the beginning. But no, I think if she had been in love with him, she would have stayed with him. But she did say she was quite fond of him. And you can imagine if you grew up somewhere where your parents basically were absent, if you've suddenly got a partner who's incredibly close and present, that could prove very claustrophobic. Yes, and all she wanted to do was go to parties in the theatre and have fun. And he was like, can we stay at home? I want you all to myself. And his his poems are very touching, but also I can see her point. And she grew up with a father who was quite aggressive and volatile and he hunted and 
was opinionated. And I think Brian was the complete polar opposite to that. He was so gentle and kind and really she just walked all over him. Would he have changed her life, not just in a kind of financial way, but was he introducing her to new things and new circles of people, a completely different lifestyle? He had the money to introduce her to those circles, but I think it was her sister Nancy who introduced her to the bright young things because Nancy was of that generation and she was associating with, you know, novelists and artists. So it was really Nancy that brought her into that circle, but Brian's money enabled her to be sort of the queen of that circle. Tell us about the bright young things then. How would you define it and what did this group mean to Diana? They were the young people whose brothers and fathers had been killed during World War One, and when they came of age in the early 1920s, they were just determined to have fun at all costs because of the tragedy that was World War One, And they were really childish in their behavior. They liked to do treasure hunts and do pranks and race through London in their motor cars and just cause havoc. And Diana thought that was very appealing and wanted to be part of it. She was young, but she was very, um, she was vocal, wasn't she? Yes, and it coincided with the economic crash and the Labour government. And as much as Diana was going to the theatre and loving it, I think she became sick of it because she said she would step out of a theatre and see a homeless person sleeping in the doorway, usually an ex-serviceman. And that really started to play on her mind. And she thought back to Professor Lindemann and all of those feelings she had as a young girl. And she felt like the current government was completely hopeless and a shambles. And she started to broaden her horizons in a way. And she wanted to, to know what was going on in the world. And Brian just wanted to sort of stare at her all day and have people do her portrait. But at that point, she would have been around 20, 21. She started to associate with the Bloomsbury set, what was left of them. And she befriended Dora Carrington, the artist. And she was really taken with Dora Carrington and her unconventional life. You know, she was very bohemian, had lovers, did whatever she wanted. And when Carrington committed suicide, that really affected Diana. And I think from a historical point of view, it was the turning point for Diana. She started to think, well, there must be something more to life. I just don't want to be a knit girl and a rich wife. I really want to go off and make my mark in the world. And I think Carrington's suicide and the birth of Diana's second child, who is now dead, but she didn't want him. She thought, well, that's going to stifle me even further. She really started to kick against what society wants it for her. So when she's seeing ex-servicemen on the street and she's noticing Mm -hmm. homelessness around London, that's really interesting that that's one of the catalysts for it because you'd look at their background and you'd look at their politics and think that it was a total product of being completely detached. But actually it's it's seeing poverty, it's seeing a level of injustice that, that partly drives her to this conclusion. Yes, and she meets Oswald Mosley at a dinner party and he has just formed the new party and he's very... I wouldn't say he's completely fascist at that point, but he's starting to say, we need to get jobs for people. We need to get people off the streets. We need to build our economy and our industry. And Diana thinks, well, here's a man that has all the answers. And if she fell for him, she thought he could solve all of society's problems. And in Diana, of course, he had a captive audience. She was a young woman, probably quite naive. And that's really what introduced her to Mosley and vice versa. Why do you think, I mean, she's not the first person to fall for that sort of um, act and, and she, she won't be the last, but, but why do you think more of the Mitford sisters weren't drawn to more moderate politics? Why, why the extremes? And, and, and I know it's about shock value at the dinner table, but once they, they've moved beyond that and they are now starting to think about society and how it works and how to solve its problems, why didn't the Tory party, the Liberal party or the Labour party appeal to them? Diana thought the Labour party had failed people. She wasn't too keen on the liberals either. She despised like the Church of England. She said it was the fault of all evil. And these were these were few she had as a young girl in terms of organized religion, politics. And I think also growing up in the countryside, they were so bored. That in, in Nancy's novels, she writes of just this boredom that they had and the they hated anything mediocre. They didn't like anything halfway. It was all or nothing. And I think, of course, when you have politics and the razzle dazzle that comes with it. It attracted them so much and it it filled a void, I think. 
as we understand it, she wasn't the only one that took to Oswald Mosley and found him intoxicating. I mean, she she was infatuated, it, it sounds like. What was it about him and his way that was that was so electric? Well, he was very tall and dark, and in those days he would have been considered very, very handsome. He was very nice with the women, very good manners, but also very rough in his approach when he was speaking of politics and of society. He didn't hold back. He wasn't censored. He appealed to her so much. And like you said, other other women, even Doris Delevingne, she used to go to his rallies because she thought it was a bit of a laugh to go and watch him. But Diana just completely blindly believed in him and followed him. And even when he started to preach about anti-Semitic things and things that really went against what she was about it's because she had Jewish friends, she had gay friends, she had artistic friends, and they couldn't understand why she was admiring that in Mosley. And it's a bit of a conflict because they are so single-minded and they did their own thing, and yet she could almost be brainwashed by his political message. Yeah, it seems so unlikely. She's so smart, she's so engaged, she feels like she has a real mind of her own. So this, this really does feel like a strange spell has been cast. Yes, and I think it's because she left her husband and that was just really, really scandalous back then. You know, she's the mother of two young children. She has a lovely husband, a lovely home, all of this money, and she leaves him to set herself up as Mosley's mistress. So she really gets cast out of society in a way. She becomes the black sheep. She quite enjoys this, that, you know, for once she's doing something and causing a proper reaction. Do you think if Mosley had been a communist and had spoken about hard-left politics with the same vigour, she'd have followed him down that path instead? That's a good a good question. I think if he appealed to something in her mind, so perhaps yes, because if she loved him so much and had that belief in him, she would have followed him wherever wherever he was going to go. Other than her being an unquestioning, adoring acolyte, what did Oswald like about Diana? I think he liked that Finally, he had somebody who thought he was just completely wonderful, didn't question him, and was listening to him. A lot of people, as time progressed, just thought he was a bit of a joke. So he had somebody that he could could completely influence. And at this point as well, Diana is going to Germany to visit Unity, and Unity has introduced her to Hitler. And Hitler's very taken with Diana. He thinks she's the, just, she represents his ideal version of what a woman should be you know she's tall she's blonde she has these beautiful little blonde children and it's very superficial but I think mostly saw that to his advantage because his party was running out of funds and Diana says oh let me speak to Hitler maybe we can get some money from Germany so there I think there was a motive there with mostly too because he was seeing other people as well as Diana he was seeing his sister-in-law he was sleeping with his stepmother-in-law So when Diana says, well, I can help you in return, I think that's when he decided to stick with her. He's a catch, isn't he, Lindsay, really, basically? He is. (laughs) Well, you know, Diana would just sit in her beautiful home in Belgravia and wait for him to come. And she knew he was approaching because he would tap his stick (laughs) on the window and she'd be like, oh, he's here, and let him in. But he really strung her along and treated her quite badly. But like I said, I think she was so far gone. Um, She needed to really stand by her convictions because she didn't want to be proved wrong. He's a 10, but he's a Nazi and he taps his stick when he arrives home. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Let's talk about their time in Germany. What did they make of it? I think when they got over there and they saw the pageantry if you like it's such a poor description but that's what they felt it was of the nazi rallies they felt like they were on a different planet because they've come from britain with a stiff upper lip nobody expresses himself very much and they see hitler really going nuts on the podium and the everybody's believing in his message well everybody who's there and the military displays they really fell for that and they thought Oh my gosh, if Mosley could recreate that, we'll be at the center of that. And also it's quite superficial, but Diana said what she loved most about Germany was they had central heating. So she moved over there for like six months and I guess she enjoyed being warm. She becomes very, very close with Magda Goebbels. 
Joseph Goebbels doesn't like her. He just always re refers to her as oh, Mrs. Guinness. But I think she finds a place where she's accepted and she can discuss politics and people admire her intellect. And I think when you're in your early 20s and people just think you like to party and you're a bit shallow, yeah, I think that would that would entice you to keep going back to that circle. Nazi Germany sounds terrifying to most of us. Do you think they were ever scared? I don't think they were ever scared, but they certainly thrived on the danger of it. Because in the letters, Unity writes of being caught up in fights in the street and somebody hits her, and she's completely intoxicated by it. She's energized. Because anybody else would think, even Irene, Ravensdale, Mosley's sister-in-law, when she went over in 1936, she was completely appalled. She thought it was disgusting, it was horrendous, and so violent, and everybody was brainwashed. She got away from it, but Diana and Unity loved that. And I think they loved that essence of somebody's in control, and we are part of that team, we're part of that circle, and they're forcing people to conform, and... It's almost like being with the puppet master and you can make people do whatever you want. And that really appealed to Unity especially, and I suppose because she was rejected by her own peers in England. So it sounds like Unity was in her element. What ultimately happened there? It's, it's extremely tragic. It is. She went over to study art and she became absolutely enthralled with the Nazi party. She stalked Hitler. She managed to meet him in a restaurant. He thought she was just absolutely nuts and funny and was obviously intrigued by her connection to Churchill. She, that, that's really the, the simplest way to describe the opening for Unity to join in with the Nazis. But you're right, there is a sense of tragedy because nobody is telling her, don't do that, it's bad, you're going to get in trouble. She completely goes for it. She's completely aware of the final solution and what the plans are for the Jews and not only the Jews, but, you know, gay people, Catholics, disabled people. She thinks that's completely fine, you know. And she gets so far gone that when the whispers of war happen, she tells her family, if we go to war, I'm going to kill myself. And they don't take her very seriously because she is very extreme and dramatic and says crazy things. But when war was declared in September 1939, Unity did attempt to commit suicide. And she failed and she was stuck in Nazi Germany while the, you know, they were at war with England and Hitler took care of her and got her, I believe it was to Switzerland where her family met her and brought her home and the bullet remained lodged in her head and it made her very disabled. And she had, I think the intellect of like a seven year old after it, her mother had to take care of her. Of course, people in the UK are seeing her as an enemy. They can't understand why strings were pulled to bring her home. I think that's quite topical today with what's going on with these girls that go abroad to join ISIS, but Unity got home. And a few years after that, the bullets became infected and she more or less died because of sepsis. Do you think Diana blamed herself for for Unity's situation? No, Diana, Diana didn't take any responsibility for that, but Decca certainly thought it was Diana's fault. She felt Diana had influenced her to behave in a very extreme way because of Mosley. It's hard not to think of them as young girls who made up mm -hmm. a secret language together and played games and were in this bright, you know, bright young things group of people playing pranks who've kind of got swept up in extreme politics with people who are much older and know better. But is that is that sort of excusing them? Is that sort of giving them a leniency that they don't deserve? I don't think we can excuse them because they knew what was going to happen. When Diana was released from prison, she would have seen the newsreels like everybody else of, you know, the liberation of the death counts. She would have watched that footage. And even as an older woman on TV, she still says, well, it didn't happen when I was there. And Hitler was very friendly to me and good to me. I got married with him as a witness. I can't really say anything bad about him so to me that's completely disgusting she could have changed her mind and she could have almost i don't know if redemption's a proper word but she could have said that it was wrong and it was bad but she she refused to what effect do you think diana's time in prison had on her 
Well, she became very resentful towards the British government. It made her even more resentful than she was as a, a young woman. She thought it was unjust. It took her away from her newborn son, and she didn't see why she should, she should have been arrested. And after the war, she moved to the Republic of Ireland, and then she went on to France, and she held that hatred for the British government always. It did the opposite. She didn't use it to reflect or think, well, maybe I did do a bad thing. She just kept thinking that she was the victim. And how was she treated in prison? Did she get special treatment that perhaps prisoners of a, of a lower income and class wouldn't have got? Well, when she was in Holloway, she was in a cell and she was malnourished and freezing and suffering through the blitz. So she was the same as every other prisoner in that respect. But as time progressed, she managed to get a fur coat. She got shopping delivered from Harrods. She was allowed visitors. Churchill pulled strings that she could have a bath whenever she wanted. And remember, you know, there was a shortage of water. And she was eventually moved to like a, a building and mostly was allowed to join her. And they were able to garden and grow strawberries and sunbathe. And that didn't sit well with the British public. In fact, when the bus driver went past Holloway, he would say, Lady Mosley, sweet. And her mother was absolutely, yeah, her mother was so embarrassed because her mother would have been on the bus going to visit her. That's absurd, isn't it? Those trimmings and that special treatment. Mm -hmm. I just can't imagine what other inmates would have thought of this sort of VIP velvet roped area. Well, it was odd because Mosley joined her and it's an all women's prison. And he would go out and take off his shirt and stretch and exercise. And all of the women sort of rushed to the windows. So I think it worked in their favor because they were almost like celebrities in the prison. So people can understand. Who would Diana be now? Who is she comparable to? I don't know. I honestly don't know because we see young girls being influenced and running off to join ISIS. I honestly don't know who she would be compared to because I think we still discuss her today because what she did is so bizarre and horrible and strange. And even today as a historian and her biographer, I can never really get to the bottom of it. So the conversation around, I think, Diana and unity and people like that is always evolving because politics is always evolving and attitudes are always evolving. But of course, today with very extreme politics, I think I think she would have been at the centre of it. In 1989, Diana was on Radio 4's Desert Island Discs. It remains to this day one of the most controversial episodes of the show ever broadcast. How many times have you heard it and did it surprise you? I've heard it a few times. When I went in the first time, I was a bit more surprised by her music choices because it starts off in a very weird way with, you know, she talks about, oh, I'm quite deaf and I can only hear strings and all of these mad eccentric things. And then, you know, they ask her the difficult questions. And again, she's, well, you know, Hitler was very, very kind to me. And that's not the man that I knew. So, you know, people are wanting to hear her say other things and she doesn't. She's very staunch in that way, very stubborn. But there was a documentary on Channel 4 and I think the title was mostly Hitler and me and she's very old in it and they do ask her you know do you regret it of course she's not going to say yes I regret it but in in her own way she says well if I could go back and know the impact it had on my children of course I would never have gone to Nazi Germany so I wondered if that was her her way of saying he was wrong or was she just thinking of herself? You know, it's been a bit of a, a bit of a struggle on my my image. Maybe I wouldn't have done that. So she's so hard to read. Do you think there's an element of pride as well that she just couldn't admit she was wrong? Oh, definitely. I think so, yes. If you met Diana Mosley and you could ask her one question, what would it be? I guess I would just want to ask her why she couldn't see the ugliness in a cause that she believed in and do the right thing, and the moral thing, and admit that it was an atrocious ideology that she was believing in. I guess that's what I would want to ask her. I wouldn't expect her to, to answer me, but I, as her biographer, 
I'm somebody who's observing history. That's what I would I would want to know. I would want to be there for that conversation. She would, she would throw me out, wouldn't she? <laughs> She's like, <Yeah>. go. <laughs> Thank you so much to Lindsay Spence. We genuinely could have talked to her all afternoon. That was so interesting. It was brilliant. Okay, Matt, what do we have next time? I've got a real treat for you next week because I've gone back through the British Scandal archives and picked out my favourite series. This is the most adrenaline fueled anxiety-inducing thing we have ever recorded. Prepare to put on your baseball cap backwards and an ill-fitting sweater and swagger through customs. You know where this is going. I will be stocking up on the fruit pastels. That's the one. It is the story of Nick Leeson, his rise, his risk-taking and the most notorious bank collapse in financial history. Get out the beta blockers. From Wondery and Samizdat Audio, this is the fourth and final episode in our series, Hitler's Angel. British Scandal is hosted by me, Matt Ford. And me, Alice Levine. British Scandal is a production of Wondery and Samizdat Audio. For Samizdat, our producer is Chika Ayres. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. For Wondery, our series producer is Theodora Leludis. Our managing producer is Rachel Sibley. Executive producers for Wondery are Estelle Doyle, Jessica Radburn and Marshall Louie.